if you have a Bible, and I hope you have one with you this morning, we'll be in 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2 again. If you don't have one and you would like one, there should be one underneath the chair in front of you, or perhaps there's one in the, in the center table in the back that you can grab. Again, we're in 1 John chapter 2. That's where we'll be this morning. Beginning in verse 7. Verse 7. And John writes, Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is the light and in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because bar- the darkness has blinded his eyes. So this morning we come back to our study of 1 John. It is important that we remind ourselves what John is writing about. Last week we had a guest, uh, Doug, come and speak to us and so we had a, a bit of a hiatus from our study of 1 John. So let's take a moment just to kind of remember where we are. So as we open up the Bible week to week, there's a lot in the in what God has given us and what God is teaching us here as we open up his word, the word that God has given to us. And so it's important for us to remember exactly what's going on in the journey that God has placed us on as his people and as a family, as a church family here together. And it's important to remember for the context of where we are. The, the context is key in every time we open the Bible. If you were just to open your Bible and start reading randomly just to let it fall, that, that kind of popcorn type of study, we really start to struggle with what is, what is the context going on, what is, what is really the meat of what is being taught there. It's important for us to know and understand the fullness of the context of what is being taught. So this morning, as we come back to 1 John 2, we remember the overarching theme of the message of John to the church is a message of love, a message to the those in churches across Asia Minor to remember their first love, to remember the message as John describes it here, the message that we are familiar with throughout the whole Bible is that the message, the word the message from John is, is the gospel. God is light. So we're starting to look at and unpack the gospel and the gospel is God is light, holy and perfect. Secondly, we are sinful. We don't just do sinful things. But we have a sin nature. Now thirdly, when we come to understand the gospel, Jesus says, and Jesus is God's son. He has become the one who stands before the Father and speaks to the Father on our behalf. So these are the main elements of the gospel. So if you're new here, you're visiting, or maybe you don't quite understand the gospel, here are the main absolute elements of the gospel. God is light, holy, and perfect. We are sinful. We're not just, we don't just sin, but we have a sinful nature in us. Third, Jesus is the Son of God who became and stands before the Father and speaks to the Father on our behalf. Remember, this is where we were last time in 1 John 2 verse 1. We have an advocate before the Father. We have one who says, you can't punish twice for the same sin. It would not not be just. So we have one who is our justifier, one who stands on for us on our behalf and before the Father, who is the ultimate judge. And so these are the basic, the most, the most basic root elements of what the gospel is. And it's important to every believer that we understand this. So no matter where we are, what kind of conversations we are having, whether at the grocery store, the gas station, or at our place of employment, that we can, we can talk about when we say we believe the good news, when we say we believe the message of God, when we say we believe the gospel, well, what is the gospel? This is the gospel. That God is holy, that we are sinful, that Jesus is our advocate. This is the gospel. This is what it means to believe. So as we come to understand and we as you and I come to remember the gospel, the message of John here is that we should be and that our pursuit should be to fall more deeply in love with God. We, we, we seek that as we read this book. Like the words I hope and as we prayed this morning is that the words aren't just static words on the page. They aren't just black ink filling a white page, but they're the words that are coming alive to us, that they're 
they're penetrating our hearts and they're transforming our minds to think differently about how we see life and do life, not for the sake of, well, we can do life better, but for the sake of it. God is doing something. He's transforming us more to be like him, to be like the son. And so this is, this is, our, this is our mission, is to share in the life of Jesus, to share in the life of the mission, to actually have personal dealings with Jesus, to actually have personal dealings with God, and to have an intimate relationship, to have a true relationship relationship with the triune God, with the Trinity. We shouldn't just sit back and say, well, the Trinity is confusing, so I'm going to just remove myself and say, well, I know Jesus and I know God, but the Spirit kind of freaks me out, so I'm going to be, I'm just going to back off on that one a little bit. No, our ultimate desire in all of life is to have an intimate, personal relationship with the triune God, who is the complete Lord and, and, and King of the universe. And so that's what John is teaching us here in the context of what we see happening in 1 John. He's reminding the church that it's possible. It's possible, but it doesn't stop with just knowing and having fellowship with God. For John also points us to hope. In chapter 2, verse 4, he says, We write these things to make our joy complete. To make our joy complete. So again, we go back to our prayer this morning. We can start seeing why the puzzle pieces of our prayer are important. We don't just pray for the sake of having words to pray, but we pray the words of God so that when we pray the words of God, we know that God is faithful and just and he answers based on who he is. And so we pray that our joy is complete. We pray the words of God and our joy being complete. This is, this is the great hope. This is the great reality that the church was struggling. The church in the late first century is struggling under persecution, under infiltration of false teachers, people coming in and saying, you can define religion in a way that you see fit. They're struggling under stress. Okay, anybody here ever experienced stress? They're struggling under stress and suffering. And John says, when we know God, when we understand the Trinity, when we have, a fe when we have fellowship with God, when we have fellowship with the church... Yeah, that's plugged in there too. When we have true fellowship with each other, then we will experience the joy in which we are created to live with for our joy will not be dependent. Get this, our joy is not going to be dependent on external circumstances. It's not going to be dependent on whether our friends are getting along with us at the moment. It's not going to be dependent on whether things are going well at work or whether the, the weather is nice or whether we're getting what we want. Or It's not going to be dependent on external circumstances because our joy is going to be complete and a true and honest relationship with who God is, how God is working in us individually, how God is working in us corporately, and how God is sending us out to be his people. Our joy is going to be complete in the person of Jesus, in the person of God, in the person of the Spirit. Not in us for the sake of who we are and what we're doing, but in the, in the person of who he is and what he is doing. Does that make sense? That we're on two opposite playing fields here. When we find our joy in who he is and what he's doing, we can step back and take a really deep breath and say, it's not on how we perform. This takes the whole performance-based evaluation completely out of our life. I don't know if any of you have ever worked in a job where you got uh, raises or you got bonuses based on how you performed in that quarter. Well, what, when we look at the gospel and we look at what John is teaching us here, it says the way we have a relationship with God is not based on our performance. It's based on what he is doing, not on what we are doing. Okay, y'all are asleep over here. We're going to go over here for a moment. It's based on what he's doing, not on what we're doing. That's a really good thing because what does it say? Why do we need an advocate with the Father? Because in 1 John 2, he says, when we sin, because even as believers, we're still sinning. So if it's based on how we're performing, then as people who are still sinning, then the problem is, is our performance is always going to be extremely subpar. And so if it's based on who he is and what he's doing, then we can have extreme joy knowing that he is our advocate and we won't be judged twice for something that's already been paid for. And we can step back and say, yes, God. And we can face the trials and we can face the suffering and we can face the persecution. We can face when people come in and try to infiltrate us with false teaching. And we say, it's okay, my God is good enough. And it's not based on who I am. And it's not based on who we are, but it's based on who he is. And our joy is in that. Corporately, it's in that. And, it's, and that's what it's going to be about. And so just a few of the major things that we've touched on just so far. And as we've gotten through 1 John 1 through 1 John 2, 6, we, we've hit some major, major themes. Fellowship, sin, joy, light. 
obedience and the personhood and the deity of Jesus. And so we barely even scratched the surface here, but this morning we continue our discussion on love. And so John is writing, he says in verse 7, Beloved, I'm writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. There's a quite there's quite a bit that John is packing into this verse. However, if we just are doing a cursory reading of 1 John, perhaps we would read right over this and not think too much of the words here. There are words that we have heard time and time again. There are words that are mentioned time and time again throughout all of Scripture. So why here? Why do these words deserve and necessitate our attention? Why do these words warrant us to stop and to unpack what is being said and what is happening? So let's stop here for just a moment and look at verse 7. And remember that John, being the last living disciple, is writing as a pastor. Now he's writing as a pastor in his mid to late 80s. So he's not a young spry guy anymore. He's an older pastor and he's writing to his, to, in his 80s addressing those to whom he is writing out of affection. Look at this, he says, the first word of, of verse 7 is beloved. I'm not writing to you something new, but he uses the word beloved. Now, we know that John has not always been the teddy bear kind of guy. He's not been this person who's been all kind of lovey-dovey his whole life. From what we can notice here is that John has, has been moved for the hearts of those in the churches, right? He is concerned about them. He's not just concerned about them, though, but he's concerned for them, desiring what? That they grow, desiring that they know God, desiring that they not be confused by the false teachings, and he wants them to be, have a genuinely unadulterated knowledge of the gospel. Not to be consumed by things of the world. And so we, but when we look at this word beloved, we remember that John was one of the rough ones in the original disciples. He was not one of these kind of soft around the edges kind of guy. Remember Mark 3.17, he's referred to one of the sons of thunder, Right? That, that, was, that was how he's addressed there. And on one occasion in Luke 9, 54, and when he's early in training, he wanted to call down fire from heaven to consume the whole village of people because they didn't comply with what he thought was right. Now that's a good one. We don't obey? Whew, yes. That's why we're not God. Be like, uh-huh. Y'all don't obey me next time. See what happens. That was the way John was early on in his ministry. He was known as a son of thunder. In Luke, he was known as a guy who when the, when the village was being dis when they weren't listening to Jesus, says, okay, just consume them. Just incinerate the whole thing. John wasn't known as being tenderhearted. He was not known as being this compassionate, caring kind of guy. So what we see here is that the apostle, known as the apostle of love later on in life, is that he's been conformed, he's been transformed by God working in him and through him. And so John addresses those to whom he loves by pointing out what he is teaching, what he is writing is not something new. I'm not writing you a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you've heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you've heard. I'm not writing you a new commandment, but the idea of something new in quality. Get this, it's something new in quality. I'm not writing for you something which you have never heard before. I'm not inventing something new. It's important for you and I to understand that as John is pointing this out, it's not a new method. It's not a new way to get to heaven. It's not a new way to fix our problems. It's not a new way to deal with stress or anxiety or persecution in the church. It's not a new way to deal with what's going on. And for we remember that this, when we opened up the letter, the reasons that he's writing this letter is that we have people coming in trying to teach false doctrine to the church, trying to teach false uh, gospels. There are these New Age movements called the Gnostics and the New Age movement. There are philosophies coming around early on in the later ha latter half of the first century. And their whole idea is that there's a, there's a better way to do this. 
There's a better way to examine your life and pretty much you can, you can have your own religion. You can claim your own religion and you can claim your own way to get to heaven. And so these new age movements are rising up and they're gaining favor in the church. Movements that were steeped in philosophy, new ideas and new ways of thinking of doing life better or doing life differently. And John is pointing out clearly here that there's nothing new about the original teachings of Jesus. There's nothing new. And if we want to take it even a step further, we remember Jesus' own teachings were based on the teachings of the Old Testament. Right? So John says, I don't come to teach you a new commandment. But even if we dive further, Jesus' own teachings were based on the teachings of the Old Testament. Even though anything Jesus were to say would become Scripture. Why? Because Jesus is God and when God speaks it becomes the Word of God. When Jesus begins to teach, he begins to teach from the prophets. He begins to illuminate the scripture. He doesn't invent a new way of living, but rather he fulfills what the Father has been teaching throughout all of history. I believe it's important just to reiterate this, that in the philosophies that pervaded in the ancient world and even today, there's a serious missing connection, which is why John is addressing this. There's one, this is one of the reasons this book has, has so many absolutes. I mean, think about that. In, in this passage that we just write, that we just read, John says, if you hate your brother, the light is not in you. For those of you who like to poke holes in things, that's an absolute statement. If you hate your brother, the light is not in you. If you love me, you will keep my commands. John presents, and we read this two weeks ago, a list from chapter 1, verse 1 to, to chapter 5 of absolutes. And why does he present us a list, list of absolutes as opposed to ways that we can blur the lines or, or, or gray areas so that we can kind of infer what we want? It's because if we are to look closely at philosophy, philosophy has basically no attachment to morality. Think about this. It has no attachment to morality. It has this way that you can kind of you can read in there what you want. You can make philosophy appeal to the way that you want to do your life. But the gospel is not like that. The gospel is absolute. What is the gospel? Jesus or God is holy and pure. We are sinners. We're not just sinners because we sin. We're sinners because we have a sin nature. We have an advocate with the Father named Jesus who came and lived and died and was raised and is seated at the right hand of God. We have a judge who's going to judge the living and the dead. Those are absolute statements. But when we look at philosophies, philosophy presents this kind of claim your own way, weave your own route into these types of things. And so if we look at this closely, philosophy, no matter how you look at it, has no attachment to morality. Has no attachment to how you must absolutely live life. It allows adherents to live life in a way in which they determine to be right. So why does this matter to you and I? Because if you're sitting here and you're a visitor, you're about to probably think he's about to go down a really long legalistic hole. Right? You're probably not too far off. Hold on for just a second. The gospel is absolute. Some would say that Christianity is like any other philosophy. True or false? Some would say that Christianity is like any other philosophy. True. That was a trick question. Sorry. I have three kids. It's fun. So, when we look at this, some would say that Christianity is only subjective. Subjective meaning that Christianity may be true for me, or it may be true for you, but it's not true for everybody. Right? So Christianity, if we look at it in a subjective way of view, it's good for me. It's what I choose to do. It's how I choose to worship. It's what I choose to, how I choose to lead my family, how I choose to do life. It may be tr true for some of you. I don't know if it's true for everybody here, but that's how we choose to do things. That's a subjective point of view. Others say that Christianity is objective. Objective means that regardless of our feelings of Christianity, it's an absolute Objective means it's true whether we recognize it or not. That's objective. 
I would say, perhaps, that there are people in this room who have a subjective view of Christianity. Now, hold on here. Think about it. There are some of us in this room who have a subjective view of Christianity. And this is why I say that. Because when we talk about sharing the gospel, when we talk about going and using words to talk about Jesus, to talk about our faith, we have a subjective view there. We, we have this response when we talk about sharing the gospel. I don't want to force my faith on somebody else. If we use this sentence to defend why we don't want to share the gospel, then we have a subjective view of the gospel. If we use the words, I don't want to force my faith on someone else, or I don't want to be pushy, then we have a subjective view of Christianity. However, if Christianity is as true as gravity is real, our sharing of our faith is no more dangerous than warning someone not to jump out of a plane without a parachute. It's that important. Does that make sense? It's important that regardless of whether we finish the message today or not, that we understand this. Because this is what John is leading us to here. Is that we understand that if we have a subjective view, then yes, we're going to step back and say, well, I don't want to go and talk to the cashier at City Market about the gospel because that may be seen as being pushy and I don't want to force something on her that she may not want. Or I don't want to talk to my children or my grandchildren or my whomever it is in your life because I don't want to be seen as being, being pushy. But if we have an objective view of Christianity, then if somebody were going to jump out of a plane because they thought it was fun, now I know that there are ways to do this, like we see it on TV, but let's just look at it from the, the realistic point of view. If you're going to jump out of a plane without a parachute, that's just dumb. Because gravity is real. That's about like me saying that if I'm sitting here holding this pot right here, that it, I, I can use my willpower to, to, and, and let go of it and it's just going to stay here. Right? What do we believe about gravity? It's going to be there whether we want to believe it or not. So if I think this pot's going to stay there, that's a subjective viewpoint. The objective viewpoint says if I let go of this pot, it's going to fall. How do we view our faith? How do we view the gospel? Is it subjective or objective? Do we view it as important, or more important perhaps, than gravity? Don't jump off the balcony. I mean, we built these tall rails around here for something to keep the kids from falling off. Why? Because if they do that, it's true. It's an absolute. Don't worry, we do our own stunts and we clean up after them too. But think about it. How do we view the gospel? John is addressing the church in a day and age when we have New Age movements and the Gnostics and philosophies coming in who are saying, you can define it and you can make it any way that you want it to be. And you can live your life in a way that's going to make you better or make you do things the way you want them to be. You can, you can redefine it in a way that makes you comfortable. You can take out perhaps the parts of the Bible that make you a little bit uncomfortable. And you can insert things or add things that are going to make you a little bit more. What we've understood so far in our study of 1 John is there's no gray area in here. You know, 1 John is one of those books that we encourage every new believer to read at some point because it's one of those somewhat basics of the faith types of books. But it's one of those books that we always need to be coming back to because when we understand it, we get it. We can always dive in and get more out of it. If Christianity is as real as gravity is real, sharing our faith is ultimately important because it transforms every way of how we do life. 
So we look at this, and we look at this in the proper context of the first century, and John is teaching us that he's not writing something new. Why is he teaching us? Why does he keep saying these words that he's not writing about something new? Because he's writing about something that has stood the test of time. This is not a new philosophy. This is not a new doctrine. This is an age-old test. This is the words of Jesus. We remember the first words that we see in 1 John, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked on, and which we have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. What is he reminding his his followers in those in the early churches in Asia Minor in the very first words of the letter he's saying you saw Jesus you heard Jesus you know Jesus you saw Jesus crucified you saw him hung on the tree and then you saw him resurrected so we know this is true so I'm not writing about something that's new I'm not trying to come up with a new way to add growth to the church I'm not trying to come up with a new way to add numbers to make us feel better about life I'm teaching you something that's lasted throughout all the history and I'm not only something that's lasted throughout all of history but I'm teaching about something that you saw. And I'm teaching about something that you witnessed, something that you touched, something that you have a knowledge of. And it's important that we understand that John is not a philosopher trying to rein back in his people saying, I can give you a new seven-step method to being happy. I can give you a new seven-step method to a better marriage. I can give you a new seven-step method to having happier children or, or having better finances. No, he's saying, I can point you to Jesus who is the gospel, who can transform everything about every part of our life. And that's what's ultimately important, not some newfangled way to do life. It's about who he is and what he's doing. And he's saying that this is what it's about. And this is how it's ultimately important. And this isn't just a theme in chapter 2. This is essentially the thing throughout the whole letter. Over in chapter 3, for example, in verse 10, he says, and by this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who doesn't practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who doesn't love his brother. There he combines these two moral tests of obedience and the word of God with loving their brother. In chapter 5, verse 1, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. They're absolute. And he again continues by keeping and telling his commandments and loving each other. And he tells it in chapter 1 and in chapter 2, verse 6, this is the love that we walk according to his commandments. Absolutes, true statements. So keeping his commandments, loving, sum up the qualities and the characteristics of a person who has been transformed. We love our brothers. We love the fellowship. We love the church. We have a great affection for those who are in Christ. We long for that fellowship and we render, we give service to those who are in Christ. It matters. Here in chapter 2, 7, he says, this is not a new commandment. I'm not writing a new commandment. I'm not imposing upon you a new trend. I'm pointing you back to the gospel. What he's talking about here in the, in the word love and about loving one another, and this isn't old, this isn't new, this isn't something John concocted or invented, this is, goes way back. And it goes all the way back to their experiences as Jews because in the Old Testament the law of love was established by God and un negotiable, unmistakable terms. Leviticus in the Levitical law all the way back to Moses in Leviticus 19, 18, you shall love your neighbor as yourself and I am the Lord. So he gives us that absolute right there. In other words, I'm telling you this, I am God, and it makes it very, very binding and very important. The Old Testament, of course, in Deuteronomy 6, 5, demanded that God be loved with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and strength. And in Leviticus 19, 18, added to that love your neighbor as yourself. And that's part of the law that's been around since the very, very beginning. And so they knew that even in their most Jewish beliefs and their Jewish faith, that there wasn't anything new that God wanting them, about God wanting them to love their neighbors. It was part of who they were. It was part of what was built into them. It was part of their ethos. It was, it was what was going on in them, that God wanted them to love those that are around them. It wasn't based on race. It wasn't based on ideology. But God wanted them to love those who were around them. And then, of course, we come to Paul, and he builds on what's happening in Leviticus, and he builds on what's happening in the Ten Commandments, 
and we can turn for a moment to Romans 13, which is a familiar portion because of its link to the Old Testament law. And Paul in Romans 13, 8 says, Owe nothing to anyone, get this, he says, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. Or he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. That again should, should well up that joy inside of us knowing that our ultimate, our ultimate responsibility is to love one another. That's the ultimate thing that we owe each other. Not only is no, loving your neighbor part of the law, but loving your neighbor fulfills the law. That is to say that all the law that pertains to human relationships is fulfilled if you just love your neighbor. And he explains that in verse 9. He says in verse 9, For you shall, love, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment that has to do with human relationships, it's summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself because love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. Think about that. Love is the fulfillment of the law. Why? Because if we love our neighbor, we're not going to break the law. Let's break this down for a moment. You can say, don't commit adultery, but if you love your wife, you're not going to commit adultery. Everybody says, Amen. If you love your neighbor, you're not going to do that. You're not going to commit adultery against your wife with his wife. That'll preach. It's a question of love. Now, Scripture says, the Ten Commandments say, you shall not murder, but you're not going to murder somebody you love. You're just not. You're just going, you're not going to commit murder, adultery against those you love. And again, we see in the Ten Commandments, you shall not steal. But it's a moot point if you love somebody because you're not going to go steal from somebody you love. And the same is true of coveting. If you love someone, you're not going to covet. And we could go on. And if you love someone, you're not going to lie to them. So Paul says, love is the fulfillment. And you fulfilling the whole law. There's an inseparable link between loving your neighbor and obeying God. But love sums it up. When I love, when I love, I don't do... It's as practical as that. I know some of us scholars in the room are sitting here trying to think, well, there has to be a caveat and there has to be a loophole. There has... No, when we love, we don't do all the inclinations of our heart. We don't do them. We don't do those things. Those things are, are, in the va are done in a vacuum. And what is that vacuum? That vacuum is the absence of love. So the message of love is embedded in the Old Testament. It's embedded in the, in the Ten Commandments. We know this. We've talked about this when we were studying in Exodus. The first half of the Ten Commandments are all about loving God. All about our relationship to God, not making idols, not taking his name in vain, not having other gods. The second half of the Ten Commandments are all about how we relate to each other. Right? If you don't believe me, go look it up. Exodus 20, 21. The first half, the first five are all about how we relate to the Father. The second half is all about all how we relate to each other. It matters. But what Paul is saying in Romans 13 is if we love, then we're taking care of the commandments. We're taking care of the law. In Matthew 23, uh, 37 to 40, when, when he asked, what is, when Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus says the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart. And then he said, the second is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And he ended it by saying, on these hang all the law and the prophets. Why? Because we see the first five commandments are about God. The second five are about how we love each other. And on these hang everything. Do we love our neighbors? Friends, let us not miss the significance of the teaching that John is pointing out to us. Perhaps one of the most defining moments is not the defining difference between following Jesus and philosophy. In philosophy, perhaps you can be wise. Perhaps you can be wise in the eyes of the world. Perhaps. And I say perhaps because I don't get most philosophy. I'm just not that smart. But for those of you who are smarter than me, perhaps you can be wise in the eyes of the world. Perhaps you can be wise in your own eyes, but you don't. If you believe in philosophy, this is the fundamental difference. If you follow philosophy, if you're 
all into philosophy, you don't have to give up your sins. The call to follow Jesus is about giving up our sins. John MacArthur puts it this way, when somebody becomes a Christian, there needs to be accounting of the cost. And people need to be told that if you're going to be a Christian, there's a commitment to obedience to the law of God and, to, toward, and love toward the people of God as well. And love towards God, of course. We need to know that there's a counting of the cost. We need to tell that we can't just continue to live our life as live and let live and do what we want. We have to love God and love our neighbors. We should remember that we are taught by Jesus in Matthew 7 that the gate is narrow to enter the kingdom of heaven. We do not need to lessen the gospel to make it easier and more politically correct. John urges the church to remember, to remember that a new age movement is not going to make life easier, not going to make the church grow faster, but rather is only going to create a false gospel message. This should be a huge encouragement for Bookleaf Baptist Church in 2018 and July 1st. John is writing this around 80, 80, 85. And they are addressing social and politically correct issues in AD 80 and, or somewhere 85. And in July 1st, 2018... We need to hear the message, be encouraged, have our joy restored, that we don't bow to political correctness. We don't bow to social correctness. We don't bow to infiltrated false doctrines so that we can grow more, so that we can feel better, but we stick to the true gospel. Because it matters. It matters. If we, if we negotiate on any point, we negotiate the whole gospel out the door and we should shut it down. We should shut it down and move on. The command to love was clear from the beginning. It's a part of the covenant of obedience that you take when you become a Christian, that you will obey the lordship of Christ. You will love each other. We need to tell people that that's what's required of them. We also need to tell them that that's the work of God. That we don't have to do it on ourselves. We know some pretty hard people. Remember, the, one of the first things we pointed out is John was a son of thunder. He was the guy who said, when this village is not wanting to, to do what we say, call down fire and consume them. We don't have to be the people who says, well, I just have trouble sometimes loving people. It's not all our responsibility. Why? Because the Spirit is in us, changing us, transforming us to be like Him. And so as we tell people that our lives should change, that our lives should reflect Him, we also tell them that it's not just our burden to carry, but God is going to work this out in us through Him. Okay, maybe y'all are perfect with love. Sometimes I struggle with it. Let's just be honest. We need to tell people that God changes our hearts. We don't change our own. As we come to verse 8, John again points out that there is something new about this command. At the same time, it is a new command that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you. Because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Now, <clears throat> I've had two weeks to prep for this Sunday, which has been great. Because I mean, I had a whole lot of time to look at these words, which y'all are apparently figuring out. As we look at this verse and these words that are in between the commas here, notice the words in between the commas here. Because he notices it seems like it's contradictory. It seems like what John is saying at the same time, it is a new commandment. But he just told us it wasn't a new commandment. But then we get to verse 8, and it seems like he's contradicting himself. But notice what he's saying here. Look at what's in between the commas. And I, I think every translation has in between the commas here. He says, which is true in him and in you. This, my friends, is what is new. This is the profound statement for the church, which is different from the Old Testament, different from all else. Never before did people really have a clue about what God meant by when he said, love thy neighbor. Regardless of what the first half of the Ten Commandments said, we are a broken people. We are a broken people living in a broken world. So when God gave us the first five commandments, and he says, love God above all else, sure, but how do we define love? I 
How do we truly understand what love is? And then we get to the last half, and it's about how we relate to each other, and how do we, how we understand love, and how do we, but how do we, how do we do that? But we see examples of love between Abraham and Isaac. We see examples of love between the nations. Where we see examples of love in David's songs and in the psalm. We see examples of love when David's mourning the death of his son. We see examples, but we don't see a clearly defined message. We don't see a good picture of love. And that is until Jesus shows up and displays love in all of its perfection, in all of its glory, in all of its majesty. Think about it for a moment. We can talk about love. We can describe love. We can pontificate about love. We can say we love our spouse and love each other. But until, until we understand and see, until we witness the life of Jesus, we have no idea what love is. Why do you think when we talk about weddings that we go back to how Jesus loved the church even though we rebel against Jesus all the time, even though you and I continue to sin all the time, his love is unending, continual. It's never stopping, never giving up. Why? Because that's how we're supposed to love our spouse. But without that example, what do we do? We should love your spouse. You should, you should love your children. But when they do something wrong against you, you shouldn't get angry. Well, why? Why? We have the perfect example in who Jesus is. And we remember what we just read in chapter 1, verse 1. We have seen him. We know him, which we've touched. We've looked upon. The life was made manifest in verse 2 of chapter 1. And we have seen it and we testify to it. We proclaim to you eternal life, which was the, with the Father, was made manifest to us. And these words are so important because they know Jesus. And they come to chapter, one verse, or chapter 2, verse 8. And the definition of love has been radically altered for all of eternity. And so we go to, we jump back to what John has previously written in John chapter 13. The Gospel of John. If you want to turn with me there for just a little bit. In John chapter 13, beginning in verse 1, we see that the, before the Feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour, notice this, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world, world to the Father, having, notice this, again after the comma, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Or perhaps your translation says, he loved them perfectly. Or he loved them eternally. He loved them. But this is the moment where they're having, they're, they're preparing for the last supper. They're preparing for the end. Now if we had time, we'd spend the rest of the day here in John 13, but we're going to do that in August. This is going to be the first sermon back in John in August. But let's notice what's happening here and let's see what John is pointing to when he uses the words, which is true in him and in you. So we see what's happening in John 13. John is going to be betrayed. In John 13, this is setting up the scene for Jesus to be betrayed. He's going to be handed over. He's going to the cross. He's going to receive all the hatred and the animosity of the Jewish false trials and all the things that went on in that horrifying experience of the crucifixion. He's going to be crowned with thorns and beaten and crucified. He's been telling them about this all along from John 1 to now. He's been telling them what's going to happen. But all along and around this table, everybody is thinking about themselves. They're consumed with themselves. And at the very moment Jesus is preparing to have this last meal with them to wash their feet, they're having an argument. Look in John 13. They're having an argument amongst themselves. The disciples, those who are closest to Jesus, they're having an argument amongst themselves. And the argument's crazy. The argument about who is going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Think about that for a minute. After three years, he's near the cross. He set his eyes towards Jerusalem. In fact, even when he takes them to the garden to pray, they fall asleep. But here, they're arguing about which of them is the greatest. In the middle of the argument, none of them is going to do what needed to be done. Remember, in the first century, when you sat down to a meal, you didn't pull up a chair to the table. Right? Right? They went into the table, which was lower to the floor. And they would sit on the floor. And they would recline down against each other. And their feet would go out to one side and they would recline down 
on to the person sitting next to them. But notice the necessity of what's happening here. In John 13, when they come into the house, their feet are disgusting beyond all disgusting. If you have children, this is more disgusting than anything your children ever brought home. Why? Because they walked everywhere and they didn't have shoes or boots to put on their feet. They just had sandals that they wore. So they're walking behind uh, the animals all day. They're walking in a city that didn't have sewage, so the sewage is running down the street. They're walking in the midst of the worst of the worst of the worst. So they come into this house, and even if they were to take off their sandals at the door, their feet are still covered in the nasty of the nasty of all of town. And here they are getting ready to have this meal. And here they are, you think somebody would say, okay, we've got to take care of business here. We've got to take care of the problem here. And, and the, the reality is they're more concerned about who is going to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. A very American type of problem. Who's going to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven at the moment? But notice what's happened here. They're gathered here, they're filthy, and then in verse 4, Jesus himself in the middle of this room stands up. He takes off his robe. He takes a towel that's laying there and he wraps around himself and he goes and he starts to wash the feet of his disciples. And he cleaned them with the towel that he had wrapped around himself. Friends, this is love. Because think about this for a moment. At that moment, Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen in the next couple of days. Here around this table is the same John who just a few... A few months, maybe a year earlier, said when this village wasn't listening, when they weren't getting the message, he was like, let's call down fire out of heaven and consume this village. And here Jesus is completely aware of what's just, just down the road, not hours away. And they're arguing about who is greater, who is going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And he stops and he gets down on his hands and his knees and he starts washing the feet of those whom he's been leading for these three years. Guys, that's love. There wasn't anger there. There wasn't bitterness there. There wasn't... That's love. That's crazy, crazy, crazy love. Because he's getting down there with the grossness of all that the world had brought into that room. The disciples were so hard-headed that they were indifferent to his suffering. They were selfish and they were proud and they're debating about all these things. And here we also remember around this table is Judas who was going to sell Jesus off for 30 pieces of silver. And in the midst of this, we see perfect love manifested when Jesus stops and he cleans the feet of those whom he loves. Philippians 2 says he took himself took on himself the form of man, and in doing of that, he made the demonstration of the love of God, the likes of which the world would never know. This, is, this love is new. This is what John is referring to as new. This love is new because it is in him and it is in you. This is not just a good object lesson, but this is what it means to be a follower of Christ. The gospel is objective. Go back to this mess over here. The gospel is objective. It's not subjective. It's absolute no matter what we think about it. It is true and it is good news. But the gospel is also subjective. It is also subjective because when God transforms our hearts, it transforms the way we do life. It transforms the way that we see others. It transforms the way we see our purpose. It transforms the way we see ourselves in relation to the person we're sitting next to. It transforms the way we see ourselves in relation to the way we work with other people and the way that we love other people. It transforms. So the gospel is absolutely objective. It is absolutely objective. It is true beyond true. It is an absolute, but it's absolutely subjective too because it is a transforming work in us that makes us different. 
different because of who he is in us because we have the example in him and now get this, in us, the words that John uses, in us because we have the spirit in us. This, this is not some kind of moment where we just sit back and we are able to be puffed up with knowledge. This isn't this morning. Get this, if we leave here with just more knowledge about what John is talking about, I have failed. We have failed as a people because what Paul warns us about in 1 Corinthians 8, 13, that we know that all of us possess knowledge and this knowledge puffs up. But what Paul says is love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Friends, I point this out to us this morning because if we come in here and we leave out of here and all we have is a better knowledge of what John is talking about and what Jesus did, then we, we're missing the, the, the point here. The objective reality of the gospel is not changing, but the subjective reality of the gospel in our life, I pray that it's changing in every one of us starting here, moving that way in every person this morning because it's changing us. This, friends, you're asking why we have towels here this morning. This is our towel moment. This is the moment where we look back on, on where we are in life and, and, and what we're doing in life. And we say, well, every one of us had that moment in life where we say, I was created for this, or I want to attain this. We, we talked about this two weeks ago. Our goals, our desires, our, our dreams, our visions for who we want to be. But at some point, the gospel brings us to the point of saying, we need to get down in the muck. We need to get down in the grossness. And we need to be willing to say, regardless of whether it's comfortable, regardless of whether I'm going to like it, regardless of any preconceived notion I have about anything, God has placed me here to display love. And sometimes displaying love means I pull out the towel and I serve in the places I'm not comfortable. I serve in the places I'm not going to like. I serve in the places that are going to be gross and ugly and dirty. I serve in the places that might cause me harm. And notice this. Notice what didn't happen in John 13. Jesus didn't go to God and say, Hey God, what should we do about the dirty feet here? Because quite often the response we have is, well, let me go to God and see if God would have me do this. Jesus didn't go to God and say, what do we do about the dirty feet? The dirty feet needed to be clean so they could have dinner. And God in all of his sovereignty and all of his glory puts us in, in places and situations and circumstances in every day of our life, not just on Sundays and not just on Monday, but in every day of our life where he says, you are equipped to serve, you are equipped to love, you are equipped to be the gospel. This is your moment. You don't need a divine intervention from God to say, Vroom, here's the light, do it. We just need to open our eyes and see that we are the gospel in this moment. We are the light. Remember, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, he says, you are the light of the world. Shine. And how are we the light? Because he's shining in us. We don't need some divine intervention to say, do we need to do this? If we're there, he put us there. He put us there to love him, to love our neighbors, to be in abundance of love, not to seek to elevate ourselves, but to seek to elevate him as king, as God, as ultimate, above all else, above all our desires, above all our comforts, above all that we have. That's what we should be pursuing. That's where our hearts should be. That's what our moment should be. Friends, we're giving you towels this morning because everywhere that you go, I want you to take them home with you. And, and, and not that you have to take it everywhere that you go, but I want you to take it home with you and let it be a reminder of Jesus, not a reminder of me because that's not good, but a reminder of Jesus in John 13 who got down on his hands and feet and did the work of love. For every person here, washing feet is defined differently. Loving our neighbor, being with people, being with kids, being with adults, being with people who make us uncomfortable, that is the washing of our feet. I don't think we have to look after anything more than what, how, and where God is placing us in our daily lives or how we can love others. When we're gathered around the table, 
we see the needs and we serve the needs. Jesus didn't need to, to stop. He served the need. God in all of his sovereignty is taking you and placing you to love others. Friends, we want the joy, we want the peace, we want the love, we want all these individual pieces. It all goes together. It all goes together. Where are we today when it comes to grasping the gospel? If you're in this room and you have a subjective view of the gospel, I'm not trying to shame you. I want you to understand that your understanding the gospel may not be a true gospel. Hear the message of Jesus this morning and believe. If we're here this morning and we only have an objective view of the gospel, the same is true, then perhaps our understanding of the gospel is not a true understanding of the gospel because the gospel hasn't transformed us to be like him. The gospel is both objective and it's subjective because the gospel is absolute and it's transforming in who we are. Let us believe. Let us be transformed. Let us see. Let us speak truth to others. Not because we like to offend people. That's not the message this morning. We're not about offending. We're about loving. Loving those. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 7 says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have a prophetic powers and understand all the mysteries and all the knowledge, and if I have all the faith so as to remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not boast. No, love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. This morning, let us be a people who love, who serve, who get in the mud, to love. Let's pray together.